This week on Vaticano. Ahead of his apostolic trip to Iraq, Pope Francis remembers 21 men martyred by ISIS on the fifth anniversary of their heroic death. Learn more about them from Martin Mosebach, a German writer who met with their families in Egypt. What is it like to be a Christian under ISIS occupation? Meet this Iraqi priest, Father Karam, and hear it from him firsthand. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Ahead of the March 5th through 8th apostolic voyage to Iraq, a land of Christian martyrdom, in a video message, Pope Francis recalled the witness of the 21 mostly Egyptian Christians killed by ISIS members on a beach in Libya in 2016. They died saying, Lord Jesus, confessing the name of Jesus. The Holy Father called the Coptic Orthodox martyrs saints of all Christians. His words came during a webinar organized on the February 15th anniversary of their martyrdom. Coptic Orthodox Patriarch Tawadros II, the primate of the Anglican Communion, Archbishop Justin Welby of Canterbury, and other bishops and priests were also present. It is true that this was a tragedy, that these people lost their lives on that beach. But it is also true that the beach was blessed by their blood. And it is even more true that from their simplicity, from their simple but consistent faith, they received the greatest gift a Christian can receive bearing witness to Jesus Christ to the point of giving their life. Tell us more about how... Martin Mosebach, the author of the book, The 21, A Journey into the Land of the Coptic Martyrs, shared his experience of meeting the families of the martyrs with EWTN News and Catholic news agency Rome correspondent Courtney Mares. These people talked with such peacefulness such pride of the fact that their family produced a martyr, someone ready to make the ultimate sacrifice in defense of the faith. Young men and women in their 20s who told me that they would gladly become martyrs in the same way as an American or a German child might say, I'd like to become an astronaut. This readiness was really there and it was seen as something which gives you energy and fills you with pride and joy. I know several of these martyrs were in their early 20s. Was there something in examining their lives and their formation in the Coptic Orthodox faith that you saw that gave them the strength to, to sacrifice uh, their lives for Christ? A young Copt knows what he or she believes in. I have often noticed that Christian faith is a very complex thing, and not many Christians know their religion, but the Copts do. And then they have this long and splendid liturgy, which they celebrate every Sunday. The martyrs, the young people, knew it by heart because they were also church singers, singers ordained by the bishop. So you can say that they have spent a great part of their lives and almost all of their leisure time in church. They were young people who had based their whole life on the church, on faith. Now you wrote in your book that in your conversations with the families, not once did the concept of revenge or justice for the executioners came up. How is forgiveness a part of the story of these Coptic martyrs? In fact, that's another astounding aspect. There was no talk of forgiveness at all in these families. There was no talk of revenge, no talk of justice. There were no demands to support the Christian communities, to help and protect them. I would say they lived in a world completely oriented towards the afterlife. And maybe they didn't even perceive these persecutors as individuals, 
but rather expressions of an evil power. Here we are in Rome. It's a city filled with the relics of Christian martyrs yeah. throughout the centuries. What similarities did you find between these modern martyrs killed at the hands of ISIS and the Christian martyrs throughout the centuries whom we revere? That's exactly what was so great about it. The whole attitude of these families, the attitude of the martyrs themselves, reminds us so strongly of the martyrs of the first centuries. What is the greatest lesson that you think you will take away from spending time with the persecuted Christian community in Egypt? My greatest lesson is that martyrdom has the function of working as a fifth gospel. The evangelists were all martyrs, and when the first Christian martyrs entered the scene, the gospels had not yet been written. Thank you so much for sharing this moving story of the 21 Coptic martyrs with us today. Thank you. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. February, the Holy Father received a small delegation who handed him a 6th century Aramaic manuscript. The group represents 87 NGOs, a team of restorers and international volunteers who worked on saving manuscripts rescued from the hands of ISIS. The manuscript contains liturgical prayers for the season of Easter in the Syriac tradition. The manuscript was formerly kept in the great Alta Hira Immaculate Conception Syriac Catholic Cathedral in Bakdida, Iraq. The cathedral was plundered and set alight by the Islamic State. Pope Francis may bring this manuscript back to its home in Bakdida during his visit to the Iraqi town. To preserve the manuscripts of the Christians from the Middle East is to preserve their history and identity. Since 1990, Father Michael Najib has been working on a project of digitalization of precious ancient manuscripts. His study has become a digital center called the CNMO, the Center for Digitization of Oriental Manuscripts. The center was located in Mosul, Iraq, until ISIS invaded the city in 2014. This history with the archives, we progressively brought them out of Mosul. This was 2007, 2008, all the way up to 2009. And Daesh arrived in June 2014, unified around a black and white flag and a slogan declaring itself the Islamic State with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who declared this institution in the mosque right in front of my church. People had already been living in a state of anarchy since the war back in 2001, so many of them believed that ISIS might finally bring peace and stability to the region. The population was in agreement with them at first, but they immediately declared, you the Christians, do not be afraid, you will be protected by us, we will not harm you, stay, etc., etc. And not even one month later, a declaration comes from the mosques of Mosul stating, you the Christians, the incredulous, the impious, you have an ultimatum of 24 hours where you must choose to either leave, convert or die. And then the decision came, the Christians left. Father Michael took his car, filled it with the ancient manuscripts, and together with his brothers and sisters of faith, fled to the city of Erbil under Kurdish control. 
In reality, I did not save this history just because I am Christian. I save this because I am human and everything that is human interests me, like the lives of human beings, and a human being becomes much more valuable when he has roots. And in the middle of June of 2017, he came to Rome. In fact, this exhibition, which we have here in Rome, is just a small fragment of what we have in Iraq with respect to manuscripts and archives and materials and photos, because we have as well the largest deposit of photographs in Iraq. The texts on these ancient manuscripts cover more than 25 different subjects theology, philosophy, astronomy, medicine, history, and many others. And so this entire collection presents a small section to say to the world, here are our roots. You need to help us. You need to help protect us. We do not have the right, as an international community, to sell arms to kill one another, while at the same time promote culture and the rights of man. decided that we have to do something about it. And Amal Marogi is another Iraqi, driven by the same mission to preserve history and culture by preserving manuscripts. Amal Marogi is founder and executive director of Aridin Charitable Trust. This organization is working to help preserve the cultural heritage of Christian communities and other minorities in the Middle East. Amal grew up in Iraq in an Aramaic Christian family. After moving to England for studies and work at Cambridge University, she realized that the Aramic language and the cultural heritage of Iraq is under threat due to the difficult social and economic situation caused by conflicts. And then I realized that actually our uh, old churches and manuscripts and artifacts are not looked after very well. They are not um, uh, archived, they are not recorded, there are no studies of them. And I decided that we have to do something about it. And that's why I started with uh, Aradin Charitable Trust to preserve cultural heritage, but also to train people, because I think that education is the best way of preserving cultural heritage. It is helping local communities to preserve their cultural heritage and training them. When I started going around, in the, especially in the villages, I realized that through looking after their culture, I'm looking after them as well. After the break, we'll hear a testimony of the strong faith of Iraqi Christians. I'm Father Karam Shamasha, and I'm from northern Iraq. My village is called Tasikif, and together with other villages, it is part of the plain of Nineveh, the plain that's also mentioned in the Bible. We come from northern Iraq, and there were more than 120,000 Christians living there. In my village, everyone was Christian. There was no other religion. A visit to northern Iraq is on Pope Francis' schedule because the majority of the Christian population of Iraq lives here. Father Karam Shamasha worked as a parish priest in the city of Al Kosh, serving some 1,500 Christian families in his own town until the war started. Unfortunately, our Christian community has had to endure many hardships and persecutions as well. Since the last ones in 2003, they have burnt down many churches and killed many priests, and many of the faithful as well. All of this since 2003. Our latest ordeal began in June through August 2014. It all started when the extremists came out into the open. Up till then they had existed as an extreme mentality, but it was never out in the open, it was always clandestine. 
Santo sotto il tavolo. When ISIS took over the city of Mosul in 2014, it gave Christians three options. The first was to convert to Islam. The second, to pay a special Giza tax, which grants them life, but not the possibility to practice their faith. And third, to be killed. When they came here in June through August 2014, you must imagine that we didn't have months to ponder our decision. It was a matter of hours. We had to choose, either stick to our faith or renounce it so we could keep our property and our belongings. All of us, may God be praised, all of us, 120,000 Christians, decided to stick to our faith and leave everything else behind. This was for us a test of our faith. Christians from the occupied zones fled to the Kurdish autonomy, to the Diocese of Erbil and the Diocese of Dohuk. At the checkpoint in the city of Mosul, the Christians ran into armed men who forced them to renounce their faith or give up all material goods they had, money, cars, jewelry. Some families even saw their documents being taken away by these men. That was for us a strong message. They, ISIS, wanted to show us that they had to come to play some sort of game. They had come to destroy, wipe us out in that specific area where we continue to speak the language that Jesus spoke, Aramaic. The very same area that St. Thomas evangelized from 42 to 49 AD, one of the most ancient parts of our church. After the Iraqi government decision to retake the city of Mosul, people started thinking about going back to their houses. Those who returned saw cities destroyed and churches burned down. What we have witnessed is a message for us, so we may reconsider what the objectives of being Christian should be, what it means to live as a Christian to the fullest, not through empty words and not as something that can be carried away by the wind. Like the first Christians having lost everything, today's Christians of Iraq give their testimony to Jesus, choosing him above all things and proving the words of St. Paul, we are treated as deceivers and yet are truthful, as unrecognized and yet acknowledged, as dying and behold we live, as chastised and yet not put to death. For a child, the word war wasn't very familiar. A child's mind is imaginary, so we weren't aware of this word. It was a really tragic night, being suddenly made to leave your home, your friends, the people you already know. It was really terrible. Hala Amir is 20 years of age and grew up in the Iraqi city of Mosul. My childhood was a lot of fun. I was kind of a naughty child. I was constantly moving, I was running from one neighborhood to another, playing with different children. We all miss those days, but they still live on in our minds. Hala and her family are Catholic, and this is something that's very important to her. Did you always have a strong faith growing up? Yes, the church is our second home. My father is a deacon and my mother is very active as well. My uncle is a priest and I myself am very active in the parish. So the faith starts in your own home and then the church grows in our own lives. Another passion of Hala's growing up was always poetry and singing. And what was it, Hala, about poetry that you loved? Was it a way for you to express yourself? Poetry is part of my life. I read and write Arabic poetry, and I love it all. Yes, I like especially the Ghazal, which is a romantic poetry. It's closest to my heart, and when I read it, it raises my spirit up within me. Hala, you are a romantic. 
Yes, I am. <laughs> when Halle was just 14 years of age, her world was turned upside down when the war started and her family, along with thousands of others, had to flee from ISIS. Hala, take me back to that night when you and your family had to evacuate your house. You had to flee your home. It was difficult because you were used to something specific and suddenly you have to get used to another environment. That night when we left our home, we walked some kilometers away to reach another county. It was a really tragic night, being suddenly made to leave your home, your friends, the people you already know. It was really terrible. But also our way of thinking changed from childish thoughts to an adult way of thinking. We didn't live our teenage years. We became more aware of the serious matters in life, like the meaning of family. We saw children and old people killed before our eyes. After three and a half years, it was eventually safe enough for Hala and her family to return to their home in Mosul and start to rebuild their lives. But it still saddens her today when she sees Christians continue to be persecuted in Iraq. Seeing your country get worse day after day makes you feel bad because of the unusual situation. And it keeps getting worse day after day in many areas of life. And this makes us really sad. Today, Hala is studying dentistry at college in Mosul, and her faith is as strong as ever. Sure, this has an effect on your way of thinking and on the faith, the experiences you live. In the war, we formed a strong personality, one that doesn't fear, facing life and the reality. So also our faith has been changed through the daily troubles. And when you pray, and when you see that God is listening to you, your faith becomes stronger and deeper. How do you feel about Pope Francis coming to visit your nation, the first pope to ever visit Iraq? The Pope's visit will have an effect on the general atmosphere in Iraq, of course, maybe also on the Iraqi Christians, but it will not change the position of the Christians who left Iraq after the war, and the life we used to have will not come back. The visit of the Pope will be a very nice gathering, to celebrate moments, be all together, but after he leaves Iraq, things will go back to the way they were. We just want to live in peace, like any other normal human being.